Hello and welcome to CE Wire 2017. My name is Graham Lackus. I'll be taking you through an introduction to OCT angiography today. I'm located in Melbourne, Australia, which is one of the southernmost states of the Australian mainland. I have a busy private practice and also involved in teaching of the OD students at the University of Melbourne, as well as running the Glaucoma Clinic at the University of Melbourne Eye Care Clinic. Today we're going to go through how OCT angiography works and we'll also show you scans of the normal eye that are obtained with OCT angiography and the different ways we can analyze those scans. And then I'll run you through some case reports that I've collected over the last six months of having this technology available to me. Okay, let's talk about how OCT angiography works. As we know in the retina, all the vascular and neural and retinal structures are fixed in position. The only object that's typically in motion is the blood within the retinal vessels. By using the OCT to sequentially image the exact same retinal location multiple times, it's possible to remove any structures that are stationary from the repeated scans and the remaining image is that of the blood within the large retinal vessels and the small vessels and the capillaries. It's really the same process that was invented in magnetic resonance angiography or MRA. As we can see in the next photo, this is a, a, a scan of the circle of Willis. You can see the major and minor vessels in that area, all achieved through MRI scans and subtracting away the stationary structures in the cranium. All right. So OCTA works by taking multiple scans at the same location. Typically, it's two or four scans. However, some of the newer software that's just about to come out will take eight repeated scans at the one location. Then it'll move to the next line in the macular map and repeat the process over and over and over. Then the software will extract the moving image from each of those clusters of four and then produce an on-face image of the blood vessels and the blood inside those vessels in the retina. So here's a typical image that we see from OCT angiography. On the left, we have a three by three millimeter scan. In the middle, a six by six millimeter scan, and on the right, a nine by nine millimeter scan. Most of these image Images have been performed with the NIDEC RS3000 OCT, which is the unit that I have. I'll show some other images from some of the other units that are available or in development, but predominantly the ones will come from the NIDEC image. So the NIDEC can take any size area from three by three millimeters up to nine by nine. However, as we increase the scan area, we do lose a little bit of resolution of the image. As we can see on the left-hand image around the foveolar avascular zone, we can see a lot of detail of the capillaries. As we move to a 9 by 9 image, we lose a lot of that fine detail. However, we gain a larger area of retinal assessment. To achieve the best of both worlds, that is a high resolution image, and a larger scan area, the NIDEC software allows you to create a montage of multiple high resolution images. So this is a six by six millimeter scan that's composed of four three by three millimeter scans. The software now does auto stitch, so it'll automatically put the multiple images together for you. And as I said before, the largest you can take is a nine by nine image, which is made up of nine three millimeter scans. The downside to montaging is that scan time takes a very long time. OCT angiography already is much longer and more time consuming than regular OCT scans because of the multiple scans at each location and the necessity for eye tracking that has to be on, on every single slice. So taking a nine by nine scan in montage form would take maybe 15 or 20 minutes to perform with current technology. What I find a good compromise is, is to sometimes take a low resolution nine by nine millimeter scan. If you detect an area of interest, then you can zoom in and concentrate on a three by three or 4.5 millimeter scan area.
OCT angiography shows us all the layers of the capillaries and blood vessels in the retina. So we need a way to represent the different depths of the blood vessels. One way is to use pseudocolor like typical OCT scans, which have different colors for different layers of the retina. Obviously, it's not true coloration. That's why we call it pseudocolor. So this image in the center gives us a pseudocolor image of all the layers of the retina. Um, the most superficial vessels in the RNFL layer are in red. And as you move deeper into the retina down to the deep capillary plexus, they become deeper in color down to the blue. Alternatively, you can have a look at the different layers by using slabs of tissue. So in the first image, we have vessels in the RNFL capillary plexus, the superficial capillary plexus, and the intermediate capillary plexus. And they're represented in the image below that. There's also some indication here of where the slab starts and ends. So this slab begins at the internal limiting membrane and then moves down to the junction of the inner plexiform and inner nuclear layers. The plus 8 microns means that the, bottom, the lower edge of the slab is 8 microns further than the junction of the inner plexiform and inner nuclear layer. In the next image, we have the deep capillary plexus, which is located mostly in the bipolar layer. So it's from the junction of the inner plexiform and inner nuclear layer and 87 microns further down from that. Then we move down to the outer retina, and that goes from 92 microns below the junction down to the RPE, and then vessels in the choroid. So starting at the RPE, 4 microns below the RPE, or external to the RPE, and down to 62 microns down into the choroid. Now, as you know, there are no blood vessels in the outer retina where the photoreceptors are. So a lot of the images here, as I'll talk about later, are actually artifacts or reflectance of some of the more superficial vessels. Okay, one of the clever parts of the NIDEX software is that it can show you OCT slab and OCT angiography slab simultaneously. So here we have OCT, you can see the nerve fibers at the, at the inner retina or along the vitreous interface, and you can see the blood vessels in that area. You can move further down into the retina and see the structures as well as the vasculature in that same area, down to the RPE levels, see the vasculature, and down to the choroid. So it's very good to be able to see structure and what I'd like to call function or the blood vessel function in that area. Here's an image of a normal optic disc. Again, you can have an image where all the layers are shown in the one picture, or you can have individual slabs. So this starts off at the internal limiting membrane. This is the outer retinal blood vessels around the optic nerve, down at the choroidal level, and this is deeper down again at the lamina cribrosa level. Okay, how does OCT angiography compare with the traditional fluorescein angiography? The advantages of OCT is number one, the speed. It's much quicker to take a scan of the eye, even if it takes a minute or two, than it is to perform angiography with dye. Obviously, there's no need for injections. In most jurisdictions, optometrists aren't generally allowed to perform fluorescein angiography, although I know some states, they do permit that, but the majority aren't able to do that. So we don't have dye-based angiography available to us. There is no risk of anaphylaxis and no requirement to have resuscitation equipment at your clinic. The other advantage is that you can, you can image both eyes. With traditional angiography, you really have to concentrate on one eye only, the eye of interest, because you really haven't got time to photograph both eyes with the one dye injection, because it's just not possible. You get a much higher image resolution with OCT angiography. You can get down to the very fine capillary level, something that you can't really achieve with dye-based angiography. And the other really important advantage is we can image different layers of the retina and the choroid simultaneously. Fluorescein is good at imaging retinal, retinal layers. Indocyanin and green is very good at imaging the choroid, but you can't really do both with dye-based angiography unless you do them alternatively with each other. 
and you really can't stratify the different layers of the blood vessels in the retina with dye-based angiography. Another clever thing is because everything is digitally based with OCT angiography, you can go in later and you can change slab thicknesses, you can change contrast, you can change different forms of image analysis, and you can do that all after the fact. Where does OCT angiography fall down compared to traditional angiography? Number one, we can't really with our OCT determine which are arterial blood flows and which are venous blood flow. We have no way to know if the blood is coming or going in or out of the eye like you can with dye-based angiography. We can't also determine blood flow rates. With angio traditional angiography, you could measure arm to retina time, you can measure arterial venous transit times, etc. You can't really do that with current OCT angiography. Angiography via OCT looks for movement of blood in vessels. If blood has already left the vessels and is pooled somewhere, or it's within, aneur within an aneurysm and is pooled somewhere, OCT angiography may not be able to detect it. With something like an Optos using their angiography system, you can do dye-based angiography out to 200 degrees. With OCT angiography, the most you can get is probably a 9 by 9 millimeter scan, which gives you about 30 degrees of the fundus, so a much smaller field of view. In one of the studies recently done, they looked at how OCT angiography compared with dye-based angiography, and the OCT technology was only able to detect 80% of the lesions that were found by fluorescein angiography. So it's not yet able to detect everything that dye-based angiography can detect. And there are a number of image-based artifacts that give us a little bit of misinformation and limit our ability to analyse data correctly. I believe these will, will be overcome in time, but at the moment there are some technical limitations as well. All right, here's an image of your typical fluorescein angiogram on the left. It images blood in the retina or leakage in the retina very well. On the right is an indocyanin and green angiography image where you can see the major choroidal vessels in much greater resolution. These images are of the same patient, by the way. All right, so OCT angiography takes samples at T1 and T2, and as I said earlier, it subtracts any stationary images and then can able to detect movement of the red blood cells within, within the blood vessels. So the sampling time between T1 and T2 needs to be set up similar to the blood flow rates in the typical retina. What happens if the blood is moving too fast, you may not be able to catch it with your T1 and T2 samples and not detect any flow at all. And alternatively, if the blood is moving too slowly, again, in the lower image, you might sample it at one point, but not sample it in the other and detect again that there has been no blood in blood or movement in that area. I can't really think of too many clinical situations where the blood will move too fast, but there are certainly plenty of clinical situations where the blood does move too slowly and may not be detected with OCT angiography. Here's an image on the left done with dye-based fluorescein angiography, and you can see a large number of microaneurysms around the fovea. There's a big cluster on the left, and there are a number along the bottom, and right of the fovea. If we have a look at the equivalent OCT angiography image, you do detect some of the microaneurysms like that one that I've circled there, but most of the ones on the left of the image don't show up. That's because the blood in those microaneurysms is no longer moving. It's actually pooled in that area and the OCT angiography algorithm is unable to detect that there is blood in those vessels at that point of time. Here's a retinal arteriola macroaneurysm. Again, left on dye-based angiography, right on OCT angiography of the same location in the same eye. And again, you'll notice that the OCT angiography is not able to really visualize the macroaneurysm, again, because the blood is not moving within that pouching of the blood vessel. As we look at our cross-sectional images, 
we can select different slab sizes to image more and more of the retina. So we could, for example, select a whole retinal slab from the internal limiting membrane to the RPE, or we can also narrow it down to look at a very, very fine slice. So on the left-hand image, it's an OCT angiography of a choroidal neovascular membrane with a fairly thick slab that takes in the RPE and outer retina. That same neovascular membrane on the right is being imaged with a much smaller slab, and the choroidal neovascular membrane does look a lot smaller and less extensive. So slab thickness, if you just take the default, which is typically around 42 microns with the NIDEC, you may not image the pathology in all its different layers. So it's important to, to go in afterwards and change the slab thickness and move the slab up and down through the retina looking for pathology in all different layers. As we know with our typical OCT scans, when you have geographic atrophy and loss of photoreceptors and RPE, you get a much stronger signal down into the choroid. And the same thing happens with OCT angiography. So to an untrained eye, you may look at this image and say, okay, there's a choroidal neovascular membrane here and here and here. And what about here? We can see all of this neovascularization. But they're actually not neovascularization, they're actually RPE window defects. So we're getting much more OCT signal going down to the choroid through those areas of geographic atrophy. And if you're only looking at angiography, you may make a mistake and think that there's actually neovascularization there. So it's important to have a look at OCT structure, both on face and in cross-section, as well as OCT angiography and correlate each area with one another so that you don't make errors in your clinical decision making. Here's a very good paper that goes through all the potential artifacts that you get in OCT angiography. Some of them in summary are block motion so the eye will move as a whole or the patient will move as a whole during the scan. There are micro saccades that happen during testing some of the OCT instruments can use eye tracking to minimize that, but with eye tracking on, it does slow down the scan rate significantly. There are projection artifacts, as I mentioned before, where blood vessels in the inner retina will, will reflect off the RPE and appear to be in the outer retinal layers when they're not actually there. You can get segmentation defects and image processing artifacts. All right. There are different ways to use OCT angiography. Predominantly, there are four different algorithms that exist at the moment. One looks at variation in speckle. One looks at amplitude decorrelation. The other versions look at phase variance in the blood flow. And the other one combines both amplitude and phase variance to look at the movement of blood within the vessels. There are also two different ways to average using split spectrum and volume averaging. We don't really need to go into any of these in detail, just that different manufacturers use different techniques to find blood flow within the retina. For example, OptiView has their angiography unit, which they call SSADA, which stands for Split Spectrum Amplitude Decorrelation Angiography. So it uses split spectrum as its image averaging method and uses amplitude decorrelation for its algorithm. And each manufacturer, as I said, does use a different technique, and that does produce different images for us to look at. So here's the same eye in different layers that's been imaged by different instruments using different algorithms. The first three do produce similar results. The Heidelberg unit seems to produce a much brighter and very detailed Im image with a great, greater capillary resolution and a much denser choroidal, choroidal image. Here's pathology. This is a choroidal neovascular membrane that's been imaged by four different units. And you can see that even, even though all units detect the neovascular membrane, the appearance is a little bit different between each of them. Now, the image has to be analysed and processed to give us some better clinical information. It's very interesting to look at a choroidal neovascular membrane or to look at the foveolar avascular zone. But at the moment, we have no way to measure the size of the membrane or the area of capillary dropout, for example. There are no normative databases 
that look at the blood volume, the capillary areas, areas of capillary you drop out. And the image analysis programs are still at their very earliest stages of development. You can go onto the internet and look at images from all of these OCT units that are in production or development and you can see some beautiful images there but if you look in a little bit deeper you'll find that a lot of the images aren't produced with the OCT itself but they've been manipulated afterwards with external software. For example here's a paper that looked at OCT angiography in different types of glaucoma and it's a very it's a very very nice paper and it shows that in the normal eye you have very high capillary density around the optic nerve and in primary open angle glaucoma and normal tension glaucoma you see a big dropout in capillaries around the optic nerve head. However there is no OCT that will produce those images for you. The authors of the paper had to take the raw image, produce a mask to remove the major blood vessels, normalize the data instead of grayscale to have it binary and then use a different software to analyze capillary density to produce those color and color maps. So at the moment there's no unit that can actually do that and it probably takes a team of computer scientists and technicians to produce those each of those images. In time that'll happen the OCT software will be able to produce those for you but at the moment it does not exist. Here's some from the top Topcon um, Triton OCT angiography system and again you look at these beautiful images but if you look at the fine print it says post work was done with Max, Max on Cinema 4D, Photoshop, After Effects and Image J and you'll notice on the images they'll put a note on there that this is not actually commercially available at this time. So you'll see a lot of pretty images of around but not all of them will come out of your OCT, not yet anyway. NIDAC is producing a, its next version of the software which is, which is already out and I'm due to have it installed on my machine as soon as the technicians are back from, from their Christmas holidays and now it can actually give us some quantification of the foveolar avascular zone so it can measure the area of capillary dropout for you so that in sub, subsequent scans you can compare your patient's capillary dropout to see if it's worsening or not. I don't believe there's any normative database for that yet. It's just a comparison to your own baseline. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you get image artifacts where you get projection of the superficial retinal vessels down to the deeper layers. So with the new software, they'll be able to remove those projection artifacts from the deeper retinal layers, the outer retinal layers, rather than leaving them in as in the upper image. So the software and analytics is coming and it's getting better. And with each software revision, we'll be able to do more and more with our images. Now, let's talk about spectral domain OCT angiography versus swept source OCT angiography. Spectral domain is our current OCT technology that we've had since the Zeiss Stratus passed away, which was a time domain unit. The spectral domain has given us much faster scanning speeds from 25,000 hertz in the early models up to 70,000 for some of the current models now. Much better resolution, much better speed and um, just a much better system overall than time domain. Spectral domain uses an 850 nanometer near infrared light source and the problem with that is that blood in the retina and blood in the vessels does trap some of that light energy and prevents it from going into the deeper layers of the retina. So there is a little bit of a limitation with spectral domain. The good thing about our current spectral domain OCTs is that if you have a unit that is capable enough, you can have it upgraded to OCT angiography. So my NIDEC unit is, has got an SLO and eye tracking already included. So with the new software, they had to upgrade the computer box with a faster processor, different chipsets, more RAM, and of course the new software, and it's able to do angiography without having to throw the whole unit out and start over again. Now we're coming to the next iteration of OCT technology called swept source OCT. It's basically a refinement and improvement on SD OCT. It uses a different source of light that's swept source 
That's where the name comes from. It scans at a fast rate at about 100,000 scans per second, eight scans per second. And there are some prototypes in production that are at 400,000 scans up to a million A scans per second which is amazing. The resolution is terrific. Image acquisition is much faster. So we get less motion artifacts when we're doing angiography. Another important thing, it uses a much longer wavelength of light source at 1050 nanometers, which is able to project through the blood and the blood vessels and the RPE down into the choroid with much greater resolution. Problem is, you cannot upgrade your spectral domain OCT into a swept source OCT. You'd have to sell that model and then buy a totally new model. At the moment, the only model that's commercially available is the Topcon Triton, which is an excellent, excellent model, but again, not upgradable from your current OCT. All right, let's move on to some case reports. Here's a patient, 83-year-old gentleman with a 27-year history of type 2 diabetes. On clinical examination, he's got dot and blot hemorrhages, rot spots, typical moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and he's got a cluster of microaneurysms close to the fovea and some clinically significant macular edema. If we have a look at the patient's OCT scan, you can see the, the macular edema on the macular maps, quite significant. You can see it on the cross section. He's lost the foveal pit and you can see it on the thickness maps, quite significant, quite significant macular edema. Let's have a look at OCT angiography of the same patient. On the upper row, remember we've got structural information from the vitreous interface, inner retina, RPE and choroid. We can see in the inner retinal layers that the foveolar avascular zone seems to be a little bit larger and there's some cysts of fluid in that area. If we look at the equivalent OCT angiography image underneath, we definitely see that there is some capillary dropout in all those regions around the fovea. Rather than just having a lack of capillaries in that small central area, there's been capillary dropout around the rest of the fovea. No neovascular membranes can be seen in any of the other, other layers. So this patient has had long-standing diabetes. He's had mac diabetic macular edema and some capillary dropout. However, I got to thinking, because this is only new technology to me, I was thinking, what if those capillaries really haven't dropped out? What if the cystoid macular edema has pushed those fine capillaries away or made them less visible to us? So with the next patient I saw, a 52-year-old gentleman, also with type 2 diabetes and macular edema, who's currently on treatment with anti-VEGF injections and some focal laser, I decided to angiography his eye with OCT as well. And we find that even though he's got a large number of microaneurysms, you can see heaps of them in that image, they visualize really well, and he's got cysts in his macula, in this foveal area, you don't actually see any significant capillary dropout on this patient. So it looks like that the cysts of fluid in, in the fovea really aren't cysts per se. They're not encapsulated. They're cystoid, and that's probably where we get the term cystoid macular edema. They look like cysts, but they're not. So it appears that the capillaries actually still traverse through the areas of fluid. The fluid is not pushing away or moving, moving the capillaries out of the way. And if we see any missing areas on OCT angiography, it appears that they truly are capillary dropout in those zones. Alternatively, if there was blood in the area, it may confuse the matter a little bit because blood may absorb the signal from, from the blood vessels and you may think there's capillary dropout when there actually isn't. But in this case, there was no significant blood centrally around the foveola. It was just edema. All right, let's have a look at a patient who does have some significant blood. This lady had cataract surgery about two months prior and then come in noticing a disturbance in her vision early in 2016, where she had a superior temporal branch vein occlusion with a significant amount of blood. If we have a look at the OCT 
on face image, we can see the location of the blood comes right down almost to the fovea. You can see the thickness map significant edema. In the vertical cross section, you can see the area of elevation. The blood is restricting imaging of the RPE and the deeper retinal layers, as well as the choroid. In the horizontal scan through the fovea and the macula, we're not seeing any significant edema. Thankfully, the blood was just superior to the fovea. Given the location of the blood and not affecting visual acuity, which was still 2020, we decided to monitor the patient. So we performed OCT angiography, and we can see that in the full retinal image, which is from the internal limiting membrane right down to the RPE, overall we see good vasculature. We can see the foveolar avascular zone, but there's decreased signal in that upper area. So we have to decide, is this signal loss due to occlusion by, of the image by blood, or is it actually capillary dropout? If we look at the angiography, the equivalent angiography underneath, we see some very good capillaries in that area, but a little bit of attenuation in signal up in that area. So unfortunately, I would not, was not able to decide if there was any significant capillary dropout at that time, or if it was just occluded by the thick layer of blood. The reason why we'd worry about capillary dropout is that would lead to relative hypoxia in that area and may trigger neovascularization of the retina and then you know, potentially um, neovascular glaucoma if there was significant area of hypoxia, retinal hypoxia. So let's review the patient. We review, reviewed her a number of times. This is an image in August of 2016. You can see the blood has predominantly disappeared in the upper area just a few tiny spots of blood. You can see on the OCT thickness map, there's only a little bit of blood well clear of the fovea and the edema figures are improving dramatically. Let's look at the OCT angiography data. So the image here is of the full retinal layers and again seems to have some good vasculature there, but there is still some loss of brightness and detail in that area. And if we look at the deep capillary plexus, we find that there is definite dropout in, the, dropout in that area, but not significantly any, anywhere else. So it looks like the patient has, has, re, has maintained reasonable capillary perfusion in that location. And there's not a lot of capillary dropout, maybe just a small amount in that upper area where where the majority of the vein occlusion was originally. Even though there's not much blood there anymore, we're still seeing no signal in that area. So the capillaries have actually disappeared in that zone. Fortunately, she hasn't developed any neovascularization. And with such a small area of capillary dropout, I'm happy to keep monitoring her, looking for any signs of future neovascularization. All right, let's look at choroidal neovascularization. That's one of the main things that we need our OCT angiography for in patients with AMD. Just as a refresher, remember the choroid has different layers. The largest vessels are closest to the sclera called Haller's layer. Then we've got Sattler's layer, which are a little bit smaller. And then you've got the very, very dense chorio capillaris. These tiny capillaries just under the RPE are very important because they supply nutrition to, to the RPE and the photoreceptors outer segments and because they have no blood supply of their own. And we'll also quickly review choroidal neovascular membranes. There are three types of membranes. Type 1 are choroidal neovascular membranes that have broken through the um, Brooks membrane, but not through the RPE. So they're sub-RPE. We call them occult in the old fluorescent angiography days because we know they're there, but we can't really visualize them well. We see some leakage on the OCT angiography, some diffuse leakage, but we can't actually see the, the blood vessels themselves, the new blood vessels themselves. If the neovascular membrane breaks through the RPE and becomes subretinal, that's what we call subretinal or type 2 neovascularization or in OCT 
sorry, in fluorescein angiography terms, we call that the classic choroidal neovascular membrane. On, on angiography, we could visualize the fronds of new vessels because they were now subretinal and they were very easy to visualize on fluorescein angiography. They're the classic type. And the third type or type three is intraretinal and, um, neovascularization, when the blood vessels actually have gone up into the middle layers of the retina, what we call retinal angiotomous proliferation or RAP. In AMD, we're mostly concerned about the type one and type two neovascular membranes. So how does OCT angiography do with those? Here's a patient with a history of exudative macular degeneration that had anti-VEGF injections very regularly from 2012 to 2014, and then the neovascular membrane appears to have become dormant. On the OCT scan, on the on-face image, we can see the area of scarring in the retina. The patient has lost central vision it's using eccentric fixation to center on the, on the cross, and the location of the choroidal neovascular membrane is here with the asterisk. You can see some small, um, sorry, intermediate and large drusen as well. The neovascular membrane is causing retinal elevation, but we can see that there's no fluid in the retina or subretinal spaces. I performed OCT angiography on this patient, and if we have a look at the outer retinal layers and the choroid, we see certainly dark signal and loss of capillaries in that area. We don't actually see any enhanced signal of blood vessels or a neovascular net showing up at all. So that seems to confirm what we're seeing clinically and seeing on the OCT scan. The OCT angiography is showing that there's really no blood flow in that area and the neovascular membrane is dormant. And that's someone that I'm quite happy to keep monitoring looking for any signs of reactivation and then referring back to the ophthalmologist to reinstate anti-VEGF injections. Here's a patient, not of mine, but from the literature that's got a choroidal neovascular membrane in active therapy. In the first image, you can see very definitely the large frond of new vessels and with treatment, the frond is getting smaller and smaller. And with the OCT cross-section, you can see also the area of the membrane is getting smaller and smaller as well. And the treatment does appear to be working because there's very little subretinal or intraretinal edema and fluid in any of those cross-sectional images. Hopefully, as an OCT angiography analytics get better, the software will be able to measure the area of the choroidal neovascular membrane, and we can then see how small it's becoming with treatment. Okay, here's a 92-year-old gentleman who is thankfully in very good health and he still drives. He comes in with a history of sudden onset blurred vision in his right eye, which has dropped his vision for, from the usual 6.75 to 6 over 12 or 20-40. He's always had a small amount of drusen in, in his retinas, but very little co compared to his age group. On the OCT cross-section, we see a large PED subfovially and a lot of intraretinal edema and cystoid macular edema. Clinically, we weren't able to detect any blood. So in a patient of this age with some pre-existing dry macular degeneration, the first thought is this patient's developed, gone on to develop a choroidal neovascular membrane and wet AMD. So I did a OCT angiography scan on the patient. We can see at the inner retina some large cysts. They're in that petaloid appearance, typical of cystoid macular edema. But if you move down to the outer retinal layers and the choroid, we're really not seeing any sign of a neovascular frond. There are no new vessels that we're seeing. We're seeing a little bit of attenuation of the signal, possibly from the dense edema that's overlying, but definitely no new blood vessels showing up on that scan. I was a little bit worried that the patient may have an occult choroidal neovascular membrane that the OCT angiography was not able to detect. So I sent a referral over to the retina specialist 
Furl letters said the OCT scan revealed subfovial PED with intraretinal cystoid edema. However, fundus examination did not reveal any obvious hemorrhage. OCT angiography did not show a choroidal neovascular membrane. I suspect an occult choroidal neovascular membrane and would appreciate your assessment, fluorescein angiography and anti-VEGF treatment if indicated. The report comes back. Macula had minimal drusen, small PED, intraretinal edema and the fluorescein angiography showed a PED only with no leakage. So lo and behold, this patient's developed some cystoid macular edema. He's, yes, he's had cataract surgery, but probably 10 years earlier. So really for no reason that we know of, he's developed some leakage under his fovea, but it's not from a detectable choroidal neovascular membrane. So the ophthalmologist plan was good vision and review the patient in two to three months and not to initiate any therapy at this stage, no treatment at this stage. So I reviewed the patient. This is his image in August. We can still see a little bit of a PED under the fovea, but all the intraretinal edema has subsided. He wasn't put on any treatment, no um, topical NSAIDs or steroids. We just let, let him be and gradually he resolved on his own and his vision returned back to normal. Unfortunately, he comes in in November, becoming aware again that his vision's not quite right and we can see that there's been a little bit of a reactivation. The PED has come back up again, and some of that fluid is percolating into the retinal layers. Not as bad as initially, but definitely recurring. And this is his OCT angiography in November. You can see that the cystoid edema, not really central. It's a little bit temporal. And... Again, in the outer retina and the choroid, we're not seeing any signs of neovascularization still. So again, I'm happy to monitor the patient, monitor the patient at the moment and look for any signs of neovascularization. If we do detect a net, then he'll be off for anti vegf injections promptly. Okay, this is a different patient, 74-year-old female who was in for a routine exam. She's under treatment chemotherapy for leak leukemia at the moment. And I found that she had some retinal edema and elevation, but not central. It was temporal to the macula in the left eye. You can see it on the macula map as a focal area of elevation. So I did an OCT angiography scan on that region, non-central. We can see a little bit of the edema in the inner retina but we're not seeing any new vessels in any of the layers. She ended up wanting to have a second opinion from a retinal ophthalmologist. I didn't really want to refer her because the edema was non-central and I didn't see any, any new vessels. The retinal specialist um, in their diagnosis said left temporal macular schesis and edema. Question mark, is there a membrane? Fundus fluorescein angiography, no leakage on angiography. So again, OCT angiography, angiography didn't detect a net and fluorescein angiography didn't detect a net either. So it's this one, another episode of idiopathic retinal edema. Okay, this is a 67-year-old male who comes in for a routine eye exam and was found to have reduced vision of 624 in his left eye that he was unaware of. Regular OCT scanning confirms retinal edema and fluid centrally in the left eye. Fundus examination showed a little bit of blood in that area as well. So our clinical diagnosis was that he had a choroidal neovascular membrane, unless proven otherwise. So this is his SLO image. It's got the typical appearance of choroidal neovascular membrane that hyperreflectance area. When you look in cross-section, you can see the sub-RPE and subretinal fluid and the, and the hyper-intense signal, typical of a choroidal neovascular membrane. So to me, I was fairly certain that that was a choroidal neovascular membrane. I performed OCT angiography on the eye, and unfortunately, we weren't able to detect any choroidal neovascular membrane on it was certainly we didn't expect it on the superficial layers, but on the middle and outer retina and the choroid, 
no choroidal neovascular membrane was showing up. I referred the patient to the retina specialist because I was certain that he had wet AMD and he was kind enough to forward me the fluorescein angiography images and we can see both early and late images that there is some leakage at the macula and some blood. I've just zoomed in on the one of the early images in the um, arteriovenous phase and we can see that he's got what we would call a minimally classic choroidal neovascular membrane. A lot of the hyperfluorescence is diffuse and under, under the RPE with just one small area of hyperintense leakage. So in traditional terminology, that's what we'd call a minimally classic. So it's mostly occult, but minimally classic choroidal neovascular membrane. Now, I believe the OCT angiography was unable to detect the membrane because of slow blood flow in it. Remember, the patient didn't present with sudden vision loss. It must have happened progressively and slowly, and it may be a very slowly leaking membrane, and therefore the OCT angiography was not able to detect blood flow within, within those vessels that we could see through regular OCT and regular fluorescein angiography. So OCT angiography is not foolproof. It will not pick up slow blood flow or pooled blood flow very well. Now, here's another patient. In April of 2016, came in for a routine exam, and I found a little bit of leakage of PED between the disc and fovea of her left eye. And on the OCT cross-section, you can see the small PED there without intraretinal fluid. This is her OCT angiography of that area. We can see because it's between the disc and the fovea, I haven't centered the scan on the fovea. You can see the foveolar avascular zone here in the deep capillary plexus. Everything looks very good in those layers. The outer retinal layers down to the RPE looks fine. And lo and behold, though, when we get down to the choroid, we see a small choroidal neovascular membrane there. Just a very small frond. So it looks like she's got a little cluster of, of new vessels. They're not into the retina. They haven't broken into the retina, but they're leaking enough fluid that's percolating through Brooke's membrane and pushing up the RPE, causing a PED. Again, because of good visual acuity, asymptomatic and not being located centrally, I elected to monitor the patient. And this is six months later when she's come in, and it appears now that she's got two PEDs. She's got a new one above the previous area. Again, both of them non-central and visual acuity is still normal. So if we have a look now at the structure and function, the top layer is the OCT scans. You can actually see down at the level of the RPE a little bit of disturbance showing up, the two different areas. And then when you get down to the choroid, that little choroidal neovascular membrane is still showing, maybe a little more hyperintense there, but the upper one is not really showing anything at the, at the moment. So whether this is leakage that's extended from the original abnormal vessels in the choroid, or it's slowly developing some new vessels in that other area, I'm not certain. But again, she's just being monitored with OCT and OCT angiography and no active treatment at this stage unless the fluid becomes central. All right. This is a gentleman who has central serous chorioretinopathy. In all instances of, of central serous that I've seen, you can almost always find a PED. And that's really the likely source of the fluid that's coming in under the retina. So what I always do is I check each slice of the macular map to try and locate where the PED is. So in this patient, we can have a look at his on-face SLO image. You can see the area of haziness representing the fluid there. In the horizontal cross section down below, you can see you can see predominantly the edema is at the fovea and between the fovea and the disc, and the vertical slice it's fairly well centered on the fovea. If we go through the macular map layer by layer by layer, I finally found the little PED on that blue line there so slightly superior to the fovea and definitely non-central. It's, it's actually closer to the disc. So that's the source of the leakage that's causing the fluid in his eye.
So let's perform OCT angiography on that area. So with the NIDEC, you can actually go through a cross-section that was taken through the OCT angiography, find the area of interest. So I've located the PED, and you can also locate it on the full thickness slab that goes from the RPE down to Brooks, Brooks membrane. What I've done is I've formed a very small slab here and we can locate the new vessel just at the RPE, just inside the retina. Now, just to let you know, this is not a 9 by 9 millimeter scan like we took of the macula map. I wanted a greater resolution, so I used a 4.5 millimeter scan, which was enough to just catch the edge of the PED. So again, this patient was monitored and he actually came in earlier this week and was found to have complete resolution of the fluid and his visual acuity is back to normal without any active therapy. When I was an optometry student, we called this central serous retinopathy, but the reason we've changed the name to central serous chorioretinopathy is in recognition that the pathology actually starts in the choroid with a likely abnormal vessel that's, that's causing a small PED and then the subretinal fluid. All right, let's move on to some optic nerve cases. So this gentleman has long-standing optic nerve head drusen. He's now in his 70s, a former taxi driver retired from work, and you can see that he's got a, a large degree of optic nerve head drusen in both eyes, particularly visible on the OCT SLO scan where you can see the you know, little cluster of mulberries typical of OCT. OCT um, imaging of optic nerve head drusen. Now this is his OCT scanning of the eye. So in the upper image we've got his ganglion cell analysis from the internal limiting membrane to, to the junction with the bipolar cells. And you can see significant loss in both eyes. You have very attenuated nerve fibre layer and ganglion cell layer there. In the lower image he's got his RNFL data and you can see very very, very flat tisnit curves in, in both eyes and very, very thin RNFL. If we look at his functional vision, you can see in his visual fields in the right eye, he's got significant superior defect and his left eye, significant overall defect. So quite significant vision loss from his optic nerve head drusen. Let's perform some OCT angiography on this patient. In the upper image, it's a typical optic nerve scan that you get from the NIDEX software. In the middle image, that shows you the vasculature of all the layers, starting up at the internal limiting membrane down to, down to the lamina cribrosa. And in the four slabs below, it separates from the most superficial to the deepest layers. I've enlarged the image from the RNFL capillary plexus over here on the right, and you can see that there is some significant capillary dropout and capillary loss all around the optic nerve head. As we knew from the clinical photograph, a lot of the drusen were located nasal on the disc, and you can see the capillaries are basically all gone in that area. Inferiorly, they're all gone as well but relatively spared temporally and a little bit superior temporally in that eye. Let's compare it to the left eye. Again, we can see in the enhanced image, enlarged image of the inner retinal layers that there's significant capillary dropout right around, right around the disc. You'll also notice that the deeper layers are relatively spared in both eyes. So the capillaries and vasculature in the deeper layers down at the RPE choroid and lamina cribrosa level are relatively unaffected. It seems to be the drusen that are more superficial that have damaged the blood supply and damaged the axons. This is a different patient who has got a congenital optic nerve head pit in his right eye. So this is not an acquired pit of the optic nerve that you get from advanced glaucoma, but a congenital pit that he was born with. It's not particularly obvious in the colour photograph, but he is missing rim tissue inferiorly at about the 630 position. If you look at his 
ganglion cell analysis, you get a very dense inferior hemifield loss down to almost 50 microns and a corresponding visual field defect in the superior hemifield. And the RNFL scan shows the same thing again. The Tisnit curve is relatively normal till you get inferiorly where it drops off, drops off dramatically. So let's do OCT angiography of this patient. In the upper row, we've got the OCT imaging and the pit of the optic nerve is very obvious in all three layers. At the inner retina, the RPE layer and the choroid layer, we're missing the optic nerve tissue down there at the 630 position. If you have a look at the blood supply though, both superficial at the choroid level and at the lamina cribrosa level, you can see very good capillary perfusion of the disc. So this patient's visual field defect, unlike the first patient who has, who has um, optic nerve head drusen, this patient's vision loss is due to loss of neural tissue that didn't form properly in the congenital optic nerve pit, but the vasculature is fine. There's been no effect on the blood vessels. While with the optic nerve head drusen, it appears, it appears that they've damaged the capillaries as well as the axons in the optic nerve. So this patient's had, unfortunately, an ischemic optic neuropathy in his left eye. The clinical appearance was typical he with a small disc, very swollen, pallid, and he was referred immediately for neuro-ophthalmological investigations, and they found that it was a non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy rather than caused by giant cell arteritis. So he came in for review in October 2016, and you can see very significant ganglion cell dropout down to about 61 microns in both hemifields. If you have a look at the RNFL scan, you also see a very flat Tisnit curve with significant losses superiorly and inferiorly. However, when we run a visual field, we find that he's got predominantly an inferior hemifield loss. The superior is relatively spared. Now, that really doesn't match with the OCT appearance because the ganglion cell complex and the RNFL layer the axons themselves are damaged both superiorly and inferiorly. So you'd ex expect a total visual field loss. So I decided to perform OCT angiography on this patient. And I've just shown you the superficial capillary layers. And you can see that there is a relatively preserved area where inferiorly there's relatively good capillaries remaining but in the other parts around the optic nerve head, there's been significant capillary dropout. So in this instance, OCT angiography has actually given us a better representation of what his vision is like. So because there's some perfusion to his inferior optic nerve, he's able to maintain a little bit of superior visual field. While the areas where the capillaries have dropped out in the remaining superior areas have given a very dense inferior visual field defect. Obviously, there was enough disruption to knock out his axons leading to RNFL and ganglion cell loss, but there must be enough signal getting through to enable him to have a little bit of superior visual field. So what does glaucoma look like with OCT angiography? So this is your typical advanced glaucoma patient, typically asymmetric, so his left eye has got both superior and inferior hemifield losses, while the left eye the right eye is a little bit less severe with predominantly superior field loss related to a dense inferior neuroretinal rim loss in the right eye. So we decided to perform OCT angiography on this patient. And typically when we set this up, I'd like to choose four slices at each location, which is that four and four in high definition with, tra with tracking on. What tracking does is it ensures that each slice is taken at exactly the same location, which is the most accurate way to determine if there's actual blood flow because you're sampling the exact retina at the same time. The problem is if a patient has compromised central vision from a choroidal neovascular membrane or from advanced glaucoma, they find it very difficult to fixate on the fixation target and their eye tends to move with lots of micro saccades. So after about five minutes of running this scan, we were able to get some good data in the first 
part, the first third or first quarter of the scan, and it can show that there's been significant capillary dropout in that area. But after five minutes, both myself and the patient were getting very frustrated. So I switched off the tracking, and you can see the degradation in image quality that occurs when when eye tracking is off, and the data in that area is not actually not actually usable. So that is a limitation of current OCT angiography is that it requires good central vision and good stability. So sometimes in choroidal neovascularization and advanced glaucoma, you're not really going to get very good data. Hopefully, as the technology improves and the speed of, speed of tracking improves, hopefully we'll be able to get data on these patients in the future. This is another glaucoma patient with an inferior temporal notch in the right eye. We can see that on the RNFL scans, he's, he's lost a lot of RNFL inferiorly. He had better central fixation, so we we're able to get decent OCT angiography. And again, in the deepest layers, the blood vessels seem to be relatively intact. But in the most superficial layers, the capillaries around the RNFL, you can see significant dropout from about 6 o'clock to 9, 9.30 in that area, and a little bit also superior nasally in, in that eye. So again, glaucoma looks like it has an effect on the capillaries as well as the axons. And my belief is that most of the glaucoma is actually a disease of the blood vessels. We're losing the capillaries, therefore unable to provide nutrition to the axons, and then the axons are dying. So what is the future of OCT angiography when it comes to glaucoma? NIDEC at the moment has prototype instruments of OCT angiography that use a technique similar. As I mentioned before, there's a technique of speckle analysis that's used in OCT angiography, but they use something called laser speckle flowgraphy, which is able to detect flow of blood in the eye, not just static images. So I'll... I'll click through this little video for you of their prototype, and you can see with each heartbeat how the blood enters into the eye with each pulse, and, and now in black and white rather than pseudo-colour. I find that amazing. In fact, it bears repeating that, that image. We're so used to seeing static views of the eye, we don't realise it's such a dynamic tissue, and with each heartbeat how much blood is entering the eye through the arteries and veins. So with the laser speckle software, they're able to actually detect arterial and venous blood flow because they find that the velocity of blood flow starts off very high in arteries and then drops off with each heartbeat, while in the veins it's the opposite. The velocity starts off low and then peaks at the end of the heartbeat just before the next heartbeat. So they can actually now measure blood flow velocities and determine which is arterial and which is venous blood. Why is this important in glaucoma? Because there's been some research done now on these prototype instruments that are looking at laser speckle flowography in, in glaucomatous patients. And what they've found in this research is that the typical arterial blood flow with that early peak and then decline is severely attenuated in patients even with mild normal tension glaucoma. So there's a decrease in the amplitude and there's also an increase in the latency. So in these patients, as I said, it appears that their glaucoma is related to vascular insufficiency. So they're getting much less volume of blood to those vessels at a much slower rate and with increased latency. So hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to use these instruments to actually detect early glaucoma by measuring blood flow rates in the retinal vessels and comparing it from different sectors around the optic nerve and then being able to treat glaucoma earlier in patients that are, that are in need of that sort of treatment. All right, let's finish off with a little bit of summary about OCTA and some practical considerations. Spectral domain OCT is already here. I've already got it, lots of other practitioners have already got it, and it's being produced by a number of different companies. It's a fairly reasonable upgrade cost. Here in Australia, the my OCT, NIDIC OCT unit with eye tracking and SLO and, and anterior segment capabilities is around the you know, $80,000 mark, 
and it's around a $20,000 upgrade to bring in OCT angiography. And as I said earlier, it not only does angiography, it speeds up the OCT itself. The scans go much faster. The image processing is much, much quicker. So it's a really, it's a really nice upgrade to have. However, OCT angiography is rapidly developing. There's really at this stage no standardization. We don't know what the best speed is to scan the retina. You know, the quicker we scan, the easier it is for the patient, but we'll miss blood flow because we're sampling too quickly. You know, what resolution do we need? Is it okay to scan each location twice or four times? The new NIDEX software that's just about to be installed will now do eight times, but is eight times going to be really better than four times or is it just going to make the scan run longer? You know, what are we going to do to minimize these motion artifacts and reflection artifacts? And we need to decide of all the different competing manufacturers, you know, which scanning algorithm is going to end up being the best, which is going to detect the most choroidal neovascular membranes, which is going to detect the pathology in the most accurately compared to fluorescein angiography, so that hopefully in the future we won't have to do fluorescein angiography any longer. And as I said as well before, there are at the moment very little analytical software and definitely no normative databases for OCT angiography. So if your OCT at the moment is not upgradable, I'd say don't get rid of it and purchase a spectral domain OCTA. I would wait for the swept source models to come in. As I said, there's already the Topcon Triton, but we'll wait for some of the other manufacturers to come in if, to see if they're better and more powerful and if their software tools are better. And the advantage of swept source, it's a better OCT. It can penetrate through blood better. And for OCT angiography and you know, macular blood and blood from, from vein occlusions, being able to penetrate through that blood and to be able to see how the capillaries are going, if there's dropout or not, is going to be much better than with, with spectral domain OCT. So if you haven't got one of these OCTs yet that's capable of being upgraded, I'd say wait and then upgrade your whole unit to one of the new swept source models, hopefully with 400,000 hertz scanning and, and the full suite of software. But if your OCT is upgradable, the cost is fairly reasonable and it's, and it's quite an impressive technology even in its early stages. Thank you.